Thank you, Ho'i. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in the fourth annual conference of the Institute. Thank you to the Friedrich Ebel Foundation and our wonderful team at Mitvim. And the second session will take everything you've heard so far and will continue to further develop it. We'll talk about Israeli policy, Israeli diplomacy with respect to Muslim and Arab states. You know, in recent years, new opportunities have been created relationships uh, with the Arab countries that have been changing and new cooperations. And we're not just talking about covert and security ties as we've accustomed, been accustomed to see in the past. We have more and more relationships that are out in the open with civilian aspects and uh, the decision makers and the public in Israel have all identified this. And you see a change in how they uh, treat the Middle East. You see that they are treating the Middle East more and more as an arena in which they can collaborate and not just with the need to uh, defend ourselves against the realization of the relationship with the Arab countries, they are showing some, pro they uh, are harbingers of progress in the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. We've heard how much has changed, but we can see that in these countries that we've signed accords with, uh, the Palestinian issue is still there. And if we want to exhaust the full opportunities, we need to make some progress there. But there are other elements uh, that are delaying the realization of the potential. Some of them can be found here in Israel, and we're going to talk about them in this session on how we manage the relations with the Arab countries by the various elements in the government. And the state controller actually published an extensive report about the Israeli foreign policy system. It identified 35 government elements that all operate in this field of foreign policy without any coordination, without any integrating organization, whilst the foreign ministry, which is supposed to be responsible for all that, has been significantly weakened in recent years. We see this um, expressed in how we manage ties with countries. And even examples of that have been seen over the past two months since uh, the normalization with uh, the UAE has been declared. And this is manifesting the tension between the security echelon and uh, the civilian and uh, the foreign affairs echelon. Is, and sometimes even in areas where the foreign ministry used to be very active and very influential, and still it is other government agencies which receive the credit. It can be found in rivalry and lack of collaboration between different government offices uh, that uh, sometimes operate in the same places with the same people, sometimes for the same goals and sometimes you know one doesn't know about the other this is also manifest in lack of sufficient supervision lack of sufficient parliamentary oversight by the Knesset the foreign affairs and security ministry as well as other parliamentary entities that have no oversight on what the government is doing in these areas and it is also manifest in the need for a greater interface between official elements and non-official elements and their role as their role in modern diplomacy is growing in a period in which Israel is facing new opportunities and new ties in the region, we must have a much greater synergy between all these elements mentioned earlier and to reduce the rivalry, uh, rivalry between them. And we must ensure that the new ties being fostered with uh, the regional countries are handled by the best hands. And usually these hands can be found in the ministry, the foreign affairs ministry. And also we must re-examine how the Israeli government is addressing the ties with regional countries. And this is what we're going to deal with in this upcoming sessions with the help of speakers coming from the academia, the foreign ministry, the press and research institutes. We will try to examine what are the phenomena and in recently, and also if we look back into history, because this is the eve of the memorial date for late the assassinated Prime Minister Rabin. We must remember what happened back in the times of Oslo. It didn't start just now with Netanyahu. Uh, we started uh, developing relations with countries in the region uh, back then over 20 years ago. We have four speakers in this session and I will uh, introduce each as I, I approach them. The first one, Dr. Ehud Elran. Elran is a board member at the Mitvim Institute uh, at the Haifa University and is currently a visiting scholar at Stanford University. He was formerly an advisor to Prime Minister Barak. Uh, Udi, we're going to speak 
speak with you first because we would like to establish some kind of a historic context and how Israeli policy developed in this region, who led it over the years, how it evolved over the years, and what, how do you see this continuing into the future? Thank you very much for inviting me, Inimrod, and congratulations for all of the achievements of the Institute in a challenging environment this year. Well, the image currently, as you've said, is that there are various elements involved in the relationship with Arab countries with an emphasis of the various security agencies. There were reports of, of the visits of the head of the Mossad, and it seems as if the foreign ministry isn't receiving its appropriate uh, position. And as we look at things uh, in a historic perspective, this was not the case when Israel started out on this path. The political effort vis-a-vis -vis the Arab countries was m during the pre-state Israel was uh, handled by the uh, political department of the Jewish agency. And after the establishment of the state of Israel, it was the foreign ministry that led that. Uh, maybe some of you remember there were contacts with King Abdallah, the Jordanian emir, and even with the Egyptian prime minister during the 48 war of independence. All of them were handled by the diplomatic or political department of the Jewish agency and then by the foreign ministry. And if we fast forward, it seems that mo most of the activities recently are motivated by security reasons. And why has this gap been created? I think that some of these matters simply are not reported or people don't sufficiently remember them. We remember the 1990s perhaps even before that, you know, with the peace with Jordan and Egypt, uh, once again brought the foreign ministry into these matters. As I prepared for this, I found that some of the people who were involved in these matters in the 1940s continue to support that. Even after their retirement, they continue to be involved in the dialogue with Arab countries. Eliyahu Sasson, for example, who, uh, uh, and he, it was written about him in the early 70s, there were Egypt and Jordan where embassies were established. And of course, the breakthrough following uh, Oslo when the missions were opened up in uh, Tunisia, Mauritania, Oman, Qatar, and a few other countries, uh, the foreign affairs missions opened them. And there's some covert activity for, and according to media reports, a type of a secret embassy in Bahrain since 2009. I'd like to say a few words about why it was transferred from something that was under the dominance of the foreign ministry or the organization that was a precursor it and uh, that included various uh, covert activities this was all handled by the foreign ministry until the establishment of the Mossad in 1951 it was the foreign ministry that led covert activities overseas it is affected by several things first of all we're talking about the type of interaction which included uh, diplomatic uh, measures uh, the attempt to uh, prevent the outbreak of the war of independence at least in the first 30 years most of the interaction was about security measures Perhaps the symbolic uh, point is the armistice discussions after uh, 48, and for example, it's Chak Rabin who was 26. They came to the road discussions and participated in the, the diplomatic dialogue. Uh, Yadin, Harkabi, people from the military, and other elements of activities vis-a-vis -vis the Arab countries. For example, taking out Jews out of northern Africa in the 1950s. That was done covertly, and this is why it was handled by the Mossad. A second point we need to think about, which is also relevant for today, and perhaps the significance of the type of interaction means that the more we switch from less security-oriented interaction, this will open up space for non-defense elements. There was an ex expectation that peace with uh, Egypt and Jordan, it will lead to dialogue between the civil societies. That didn't happen. There's an initial impression that it will happen with these new normalization accords, and this will bring in uh, non-security-oriented uh, elements. There are various uh, practices elements that have to do with the policy with these countries. Another issue, this uh, area before the War of Independence was open and, you know, people like Eliyahu Eilat, who was head of the political department and the first ambassador to the U.S., he studied for his B.A. studies in the Beirut American University. People who became very senior in the Arab world, Eliyahu Sasson, who was in charge of many of the contacts with the Egyptians. He was born in Damascus and he sent his wife to Damascus so that 
with their son, Moshe Sasson, who was later on appointed as ambassador to Egypt, uh, was there. And these are people who, who lived in an open region and they knew uh, personally the Arab uh, world. And as these new accords will enable these contexts, this will create a greater cadre of, a peep, cadre of people who are not necessarily from the security field and who will be involved in these uh, relationships. And back then, and to a certain extent today, diplomacy in the Middle East is important, but it's less important in comparison to diplomacy with the superpowers. We saw the key, the importance of the US, even in obtaining recent uh, accords, especially the one with Sudan. And the significance is as the Americans pull out of the region and the more we see the entrance of other superpowers into the region, we will need diplomats who will be involved in this field and not just people from the security establishment. And much of our diplomacy with the Arab world is done by the US, or rather it is American incentives that motivate this. In various other areas, we see the Americans pulling back and a space, a void will open up. And as we talked about the void that's opening up in the Eastern Mediterranean, and as the Turks enter this uh, open space, uh, will continue in our region as well as the Americans pull out. There's be, there will be more room for, for more significant Israeli diplomacy in managing this region. Another point is that many of the achievements in the past 20 years were achieved in multilateral realms. The first mission in Dubai in 2005 was part of a the UN Renewable Energy Organization, uh, that kind of went beneath the radar, but Israel uh, became for the first time one of the uh, agencies that establish a regional organization, the gas forum in Cairo. We can imagine other fora, regional fora that Israel will take part in, and the multilateral uh, space because of the Israeli uh, structure is mainly diplomatic, so I have no doubt that there will be need for a greater involvement of the foreign ministry. There are other structural questions. Foreign ministries, not just in Israel, like Ofer Shelach mentioned, and as you said, are uh, being challenged. If I use the, the, if I'll use the Silicon Valley jargon, they're being disrupted because of technology, which makes it much easier to establish direct relations between individuals, and uh, not necessarily between foreign ministries, and also because of the type of governance we see both in Israel and in other countries in which the leadership was is called, you know, a team diplomat, uh, whether it's the president in the U.S. here in Israel, it's the prime minister, they are constantly involved in the some significant aspects of diplomacy. And here as well, it depends on this uh, international global trend. We've seen a renewed enhancement of the nation state and the nation state mechanisms. So the uh, agency involved in the nation state in foreign policy, structurally, there is a chance that they will be further strengthened, especially as most countries around us, uh, the state mechanism is still very strong there in the relationship with the US or Western European countries. These are open societies. There are a lot of dialogues that between academics and business people, but in a region in which the state is still strong, and that is the situation in most countries around us, there will be a need for state involvement. And my last point, which is a broad point regarding Israeli diplomacy, and it uh, has to do with something I said earlier. We relied in many areas on the central location of the U.S. and its importance in multilateral organizations, for example, its veto in the U.N., but uh, the more the U.S. continues in their path of America first and as it distances itself uh, from international mechanisms, we've seen how the U.S. has pulled out of several organizations under Trump, but uh, I believe that perhaps with Biden as well, we can also see that and uh, the more we see that we will need more creative diplomacy professionals who will be able to navigate Israel in which we are parting from one superpower and another superpower will rise to power. It was very convenient for us to lean on the Americans, but perhaps this era has come to an end. So these were some very brief opening comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Udi. That created a very good basis for our discussion in this session. The next speaker is Chaim Regev, Deputy Director General for Middle East in the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who works very closely with the Foreign Minister Gavi Ashkenazi, and he can share with us his view, the ministry's view regarding the role of the Foreign Ministry in establishing ties recently with the Gulf countries and the role of the Foreign Ministry in designing the foreign relationship between Israel and Arab countries. Hi, everyone. 
First of all, I've been in this business. I've served as Deputy Director General for Middle East in the past five years. And before that, I was involved in the Gulf countries. I'll talk about that later, but I cannot ignore what Knesset member Shelach said. I think everything that he said and everything others have said about this status, the position of the foreign ministry is true for six months ago. Today, we have a foreign minister who's working full time and he is really placing the ministry at a completely different place, whether we're talking about budgets and involvement. I can, and I'm not going to get into all the details of where it is found in the peace accords, the Abraham Accords. I see here three uh, former ambassadors, Dani Carmon, Baruch Bina, and many others who can tell you from their experience. I don't wish to get into this argument. It's not that I think. I can tell you that it's in a very different position now, the foreign ministry, since we've had a full-time minister with uh, some uh, true political clout. But I'm a professional, so I'm not going to get into all that. I would like to say that ultimately, and I can describe what the ministry has done in recent years, we need to see not just what's happening inside Israel, but we should see what's happening in other places. Ultimately, when you wish to examine who are the people in the region, in the Arab countries that ties have been formed with in recent years, ultimately, it's not foreign ministries, it's the, uh, you know, the ruler very uh, security entities and quite naturally their partners, whether it's the Mossad or other uh, agencies who are involved in intel and security affairs. So ultimately, to a great extent, this reflects uh, the interest of our uh, interlocutors or counterparts. Uh, the foreign uh, ministry is perceived by the region, by the Arab world, as the last frontier before normalization. Once you reach the foreign ministry, it means we're truly heading towards a full uh, accords. We're not a covert organization. And this is why there were some apprehensions. And despite that, I would like to say that since the 1990s, we've had a dominant and continuous uh, presence in all Gulf countries. When I say presence, not necessarily physical presence, but uh, some kind of context with all elements in the region, it's been my privilege to and the honor to open Israel's mission in Oman two years ago. I was there for two years between 96 to 98 and then during this millennium in the different missions, missions were shut down and uh, we were only left with the peace country since 2009. And yet throughout these years, the ties with the Gulf countries were maintained. Every country had this different package and every country in every country, we created the specific type of ties that are typical of that country. And I think that the greatest achievement of the foreign ministry, maybe we're not at the forefront, and we've heard this, is the normalization. What's the normalization? Because I have traveled to many countries in the region within my capacity, within my job, and it's become normalized they've, or customized. It's, they've become customized to us coming there. The mission in Abu Dhabi since 2016, I opened that mission, Israel's mission there. And since 2016, we've had a regular mission of Israel in Abu Dhabi. It was about renewable energies and that meant I always travel there under my passport, under my name, not with a foreign passport, but with the passport of an Israeli diplomat and my capacity as Deputy Director General of the Middle East. And that's how I traveled there. And the first time I got there seven or eight years ago, I'm talking about these places, for example, in the UAE, it took them about two hours to let me in. They placed me in a VIP lounge. That was at the beginning. But last time, the, uh, the very last few visits there, it only took like five minutes and I came with my passport. And I think that this is one of the most important things of the Middle East and that maybe be, that the foreign ministry did and not everybody knows about that because when we were there, we spoke with uh, non-intel elements, civilian elements, and they know exactly how to make the distinction between representatives of the security establishment in Mossad and who's a representative of the foreign ministry. We never hid who we are. And therefore, once you have such a breakthrough and indeed 
We, uh, the Prime Minister deserves a lot of credit uh, for the accords uh, with the UAE and Bahrain, but ultimately uh, an infrastructure, very significant infrastructure was established there for this opening. And when we were there, when we are there, there are four main levels. There's the diplomatic level, a lot of diplomatic politi political talks with elements in the foreign ministry and others in which we talked about the regional arena, what can be done, what cannot be done. But that was a more narrow circle. The second tier or the second level was the, the second minister was the economic minister and a lot of business people and various Israeli civilian elements led by the foreign ministry, they traveled to Gulf countries, whether it was Oman, the UAE or Bahrain or other countries as well. Without the foreign ministry, they could never have gone there. Other elements do not promote trade relations. That's the second package. The third package, quite a few people-to-people -people activities were created, you know, to win the hearts and minds. Everybody looks at the peace accords with Jordan and Egypt, and uh, regretfully, the difference, the gap there between the relationship between the governments and the security establishments and uh, the street, the difference, the gap is immense there, and I'll soon say something about that. And we understood that, and this is why every once in a while we tried as much as we can to connect between elements from the civil society, and there was this tremendous investment in social media. The uh, foreign ministry websites in Arabic are leading websites. We have over a hundred exposures a month, a million from the entire region. And in this framework, we also hold surveys in the Arab world. It's no secret our situation in Egypt is not good at all. In Jordan, it's very bad. On the other hand, you know, the first place where we did a survey or several surveys, who wants ties with Israel? The first one was Iraq. I'm not talking about the Kurds, I'm talking about Baghdad. We opened the virtual uh, embassy which in Iraq, which is one of our most active ones. So we invested a lot in social media. So when there is this breakthrough, and uh, we were waiting for this surprise, and we do hope that it was created, that all that we did actually placed the infrastructure and the foundation. It's not like the uh, cold peace with Egypt that that one day we have to build everything from scratch. We are in a totally different situation concerning what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is doing today. And I set aside all the ceremonies as who is in the front and who is in the back. In the bottom line, I have to say that at the level of the professional officers, there's a good relationship and collaboration with all that is happening in the UAE. I uh, went uh, with the delegation uh, and leading the professional ties with the uh, UAE, with the Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the head of the NSC, the Director General of the Premier's Office, etc. There is truly an outstanding collaboration. There are partners, you know, work groups, uh, the Director Generals uh, of different government agencies are uh, leading, and the system understands that there's something big happening. You can fall over the credit, uh, uh, but as soon as that opens, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not only a full partner, but is also a leader. This past week, I had the privilege uh, of actually giving the Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs the uh, letter uh, that allows them to open their mission, and uh, they gave us a letter in which they announced that they will open embassies in Abu, in Tel Aviv, and they invite us to open ours in Abu Dhabi. And ultimately, the ones who uh, set up the uh, missions, the ones who will operate uh, these missions, would be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Nobody else knows how to do this. So I'm very, very happy uh, to hear the people fear for the status of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but at, less, at least on the executive level, I'm very happy to say that we are in a totally different place in the context of our relations with the Gulf countries as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to mention that in the uh, survey that was mentioned, uh, the question about, you know, changing uh, the uh, 
roles uh, or the personas uh, um, serving as ministers of foreign affairs. And the fear was raised uh, against uh, Gabi Ashkenazi leaving his uh, position. Ksenia was, is a former a member of Knesset. She is the head of the Israel Relations in the Middle East in the Mitvim uh, uh, Institute and is a lecturer in Herzliya IDC. She will talk about the role of the Knesset and how she saw uh, from the eyes of a Knesset member the functioning of the various government agencies uh, and the political level, the diplomatic level, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ksenia, please. Okay, technology is now settled and we can start. Thank you, thank you, Nimrod. I will try to not take more of the seven minutes that were given to me for the simple reason that we actually took a whole aspect of the foreign relations of the state of Israel with countries in the world and specifically with Arab countries in the Middle East. And I think that it is exactly in those past two months when we hear, hear about new agreements with the neighboring countries such as the uh, UAE in Bahrain, the feeling of the Knesset in general is a body that should oversee the work of the government and the feeling of the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee of the Knesset in whose hands uh, are the full powers of oversight and auditing the work of the government. This committee was totally left out of the negotiations and the processes, the diplomatic processes uh, that took place and uh, astonished us, you know, the rank and file, but not just the rank and file, even the experts. Uh, we never expected that. That was a good surprise for a change, but where is the Knesset in this entire process? I can say as a person who sat in the Foreign Affairs and Security uh, Committee of the 20th Knesset, regretfully, the Knesset in general is not carrying out its job as an authority that should very meticulously oversee processes led by the government. And specifically in the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee, there were hardly any discussions uh, about uh, processes that were uh, ripening uh, at that time. Since the uh, government was established in, 2019, in 2015, uh, there were more and more talks about the possibility of having some sort of a process between us and the Gulf countries in 2016. Ministers traveled to these countries during 2016, 17, and 18. It was very strange to me why the Knesset is not at all discussing the ramifications of those processes, the participation of different agencies within the government. Who was actually leading those processes? I wondered. The information was not available to members of Knesset uh, who submitted questions neither to me and other case who wanted to ask questions about them. We were rejected up front. They told us that they would not be answering these uh, questions for security reasons. That is always the ultimate reason why no information is being released to the legislators uh, concerning the work of the government to know if it actually uh, does its job in an optimal way. And I can tell you now, two years after, almost two years, that we in Mitvim have published recently a very interesting study uh, concerning governmental tactics, concerning the relations with the region, and one of the key uh, facts that we found there was the absence of an integrating body between the different agencies that work in this field. And as I said, the powers of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs indeed were very generously delegated among various uh, entities when there is prominence to the security establishment. And it's true that in the past six months, we see more and more involvement and engagement and even leadership of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But we have to bear in mind that our relations with the region cannot be summed up only as a strategic relations with Jordan and Egypt. Time and time again, we discover that the agencies that lead the uh, communication with these countries 
are not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who is perhaps engaged and involved, but they are not allowed to lead anything. And as it was said in one of the me meetings of the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee, we are actually uh, nurturing those uh, uh, security affairs. When he was asked about the various aspects of our relations with Egypt, he said, so from what we can highlight here, we can say that the Knesset is in general very weak as an entity that should oversee the government, specifically weak in its foreign affairs and security committee that doesn't do its job for political uh, reasons, avoids important processes and discussions concerning what is taking place right now before our eyes, not something that happened uh, years ago. And the dominance of the security uh, issues in the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee in contrast with foreign affairs uh, issues uh, and updates of the committee. The subcommittee for foreign affairs that is, was established within this committee uh, convenes uh, very, very seldom. Uh, sometimes months go by without holding any in-depth discussions or any discussions for that matter. In between discussions, months can pass by. And now with the corona, I'm sure it's even harder. Maybe it is uh, easier because of the Zoom option. But in any case, these are very, very uh, few uh, discussions and definitely not very frequent. As I said, concerning the findings that we brought up in our study together with Uri Alom, concerning the different governmental practices, we uh, see many agencies in the security establishment of the various government ministries that are, are involved in foreign affairs. There's no one dominant integrating entity that uh, divides the labor and uh, jobs, defines them. There's competition concerning powers and authorities. I met with a number of European diplomats who told me that when they go to Israel, they never know who they will meet and from what ministry. And in our recommendations, we actually wanted to authorize one agency to integrate the relations with these specific countries in the Middle East and would uh, de delineate a strategy on the matter when uh, the IDF prioritizes the security and defense and strategic relations. The foreign ministry believes that the civilian relations, the diplomatic uh, relations are the most important ones. And there has to be some sort of of an agency that would tell us how to work with each and every one of those countries so as we do not decentralize these uh, uh, connections and uh, spread them to different uh, entities that do the same job. The State of Israel needs to have one address that would think about those collaborations, uh, things that uh, very often people don't think about, or other entities that are too weak to advance these topics and in any strategic manner to manage all the information that exists and quantities of information exists. We understand that the various agencies have huge bodies of knowledge, but when there are no collaborations, then they're not being tapped. And this is something that we truly need to improve and advance so that we'll have a lot more possibilities and a very clear paved way concerning very important processes that take place. I'd like to sum up and tell you that it's true that this is only the beginning of the process. This is a very important process of, of completing uh, uh, this matter of becoming, uh, you know, a part and parcel of the Middle East. Not only is the state of Israel not boycotted, but there are those who are seeking its uh, closeness and friendship. And this necessitates uh, a very clear discussion of these processes so that we start them the right way, on the right foot, regardless of various political inclinations. And they need to understand that together with these principles and with the huge possibilities that open up to our country uh, on the political, the diplomatic, the military, and the economic field, 
fields, there are significant challenges that we need to contend with. Various attempts of foreign entities to impact our policy here in Israel, the intervention of hacker, hackers, electronic army, and there are those countries that exploit these vis-a-vis -vis those they consider their enemies, but also amongst friends, not only foes. We need to know how to work in collaboration between diverse entities that exist on this uh, spectrum between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Strategy, the Ministry for Jerusalem Affairs, the IDF, uh, Shabak, uh, the Intelligence Directorate, etc. So I truly uh, recommend that perhaps we publish the link to the position paper that we published concerning governmental practices, and that explains a great deal of the lacunas that exist. And in my view, and in the between view, the situations in which uh, agreement are assigned, even if these are important and historic uh, procedures, but they are nonetheless are written without anyone in the Knesset or the Foreign Affairs and Security for, uh, Committee ever witnessed. And there are uh, others who say, we don't even know what we're talking about. And these uh, agreements are already being signed. Of course, this must change and it must uh, function in a totally different way. Thank you, Ksenia, the fourth speaker. Uh, you know, she is also from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She is VP Economy, and she will talk to us about the importance of economic diplomacy in the relations between Israel and its neighbors. She will tell us about key uh, projects that uh, take place between Israel and the Arab countries, with an emphasis on Jordan, with whom we have tough uh, economic relations, and perhaps there we can advance things. And also to look at the great uh, uh, potential. Uh, in the relations with the Gulf country and what to do so that it, we don't miss out on this chance. Yeah, El, please. First of all, I'm very happy to be with you. Congratulations to Mitvin for, for your activities throughout the year. Yeah, the support that you give to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it definitely helps us and I hope it helps you. You wanted me to talk about economic diplomacy, but perhaps I'll say for something more general concerning the economic diplomacy. Uh, economic diplomacy is the growth engine of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ehud Iran talked about the challenging of uh, opposed to ministries of foreign affairs and really find ourselves leading a totally new agenda in diplomacy. The COVID challenge only highlighted the role played by the MFA, whether it has to do with the procurement of medical equipment or aviation issues that need to be settled with other elements of the system, connecting Israel to international uh, programs, uh, vaccines, etc., and also Israeli innovation that is being uh, uh, leveraged uh, in order to connect uh, the capabilities of the State of Israel with other countries who experience COVID. And that's the role of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to make Israel relevant and an asset to other countries. From a survey that we conducted concerning the work of our missions in the past two years, the involvement of Israeli uh, missions in advancing deals of Israeli companies we reached the sum of $7.9 billion uh, of, that the missions uh, were involved in advancing one way or another. An ambassador is in the field and is familiar with people on the ground, knows how to open doors to companies and to make effective connections. $7.6 billion, the meaning is that if every 1 billion shekels of export creates 2,500 jobs, the meaning is that that advances the creation of 76,000 jobs for the Israeli uh, uh, economy and another 675 uh, billions for the Israeli uh, product. So definitely the Ministry of Foreign Affairs creates value, it's an asset and contributes not only to the strategic and political security, but also the economic security of the state of Israel. So after this very important introduction, I'd like to say that in the last few months, we've been experiencing an extraordinary time of a very committed minister who asks and spurs and, and asks 
asks and learns and brings budgets and creates that political connection that is so necessary. The officers of the MFA work, identify opportunities and strive to realize them. It's true on the global level, but also in the Middle East and in the uh, region. So as I said, the MFA is in the field, or ambassadors are in the field, they have access to decision makers. And let's put it this way, it is more challenged in the reality in the Middle East, but the fact that the commission, that the mission knows how to map and identify a need and also to create the connections with business uh, leadership or global companies that reside in certain countries and it's true for the Middle Eastern area, if we identify the need, when there's a need, there's a way. And we saw this in the Middle East, and I can give you the example of Jordan in 2011, when we saw how the situation in Syria impacts the export possibilities of Jordan. We did our preparation work uh, led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, together with government agencies, the private sector, and civil NGOs, and we designed the infrastructure so that when the Jordanian come and ask us to export their goods from the Haifa port, we'll be able to tell them that in two weeks that would be an, an option. And since 2012, the State of Israel has served as a terrestrial bridge for Jordan, and that happened even before the dramatic changes of the last few months. So I believe that identifying the need and the creation of connections that actually take either Israeli power or an Israeli need vis-a-vis -vis the ability or the need of another country, these are important. I'll give you a small example, but it does attest to the potential of economic uh, diplomacy in creating uh, bonds. And that is the need of Israeli high tech in software engineers and people. We started advancing uh, our activity in the past year and a half vis-a-vis -vis Jordan in order to create that opportunity in which uh, software engineers and employees in Jordan would be a place for outsourcing of uh, Israeli companies. It was a process that we started, but it's hard to advance it because of COVID. It's I impossible to have physical uh, meetings and sessions, but that can win over many barriers and create connections that would provide Jordan with value. I'd like to give you an example from uh, Egypt. The quality in dry industrial zones that operate in uh, Egypt for almost 15 years, provide employment for 30, 300,000 households in uh, Egypt. So it's true that the public opinion is quite challenging for us, and there are various barriers, but the knowledge that 300,000 households in Egypt, in the worst times even, um, earn their livelihood thanks to the peace with Israel and the economic collaboration with Israel has great value and it creates a very important anchor in a country such as Egypt. I'd like to also add and say that the gas discoveries changed the standing of the state of Israel in Israel and turned it into a major player and an exporter. The uh, ENGF uh, was mentioned here, the original uh, gas form was an initiative of Minister of Energy Stein and the Egyptian uh, uh, minister, they created a coalition. And I believe it's a wonderful thing that four or five years ago was hard to conceive. I remember that uh, in one of the conferences, I talked about the need to have regional collaboration so that all of us together will be able to exhaust the gas potential. And it sounded uh, surreal to use these terms. And there you go, three or four years later, we have a regional gas forum or energy forum that serves as private sector, not just the government, and it uh, conveys a message of stability and it can serve as an entity that would, would lure large companies to this re region, exporting gas to Egypt and to Jordan. Uh, is are also very, very important. So I said the relevance of the creation of collaborations that answer a certain need. Whenever there's a need, you can find a solution for them. And that's one of our missions, to identify those uh, points where Israel can be of an asset to neighboring countries. Of course, the dramatic development of the past uh, month and a half or two months, the Abraham agreements, you cannot but be so moved. Uh, you can cannot uh, undermine the importance of this development. The Americans have a leading role in this, and I think that indeed 
much was said about the uh, fear of having uh, the U.S. distance itself from the Middle East, but I see the U.S. very present here. I can see the uh, Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of State being involved in those processes, and that too is a statement. Perhaps they're not as engaged as in the past, but it's too early to lament uh, American presence in the uh, region. There's no doubt that in the relations that are being uh, woven with uh, EUA, um, EAU, uh, we see the enthusiasm of the business community and also building the infrastructure, and that's our role of the government. And uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs definitely plays a central role, and the NSC and the Premier's Office. We work with all the rest of the agencies with an emphasis on those working uh, in the economic field. In the visit that we had last uh, week, very important uh, agreements were signed, and these lay the uh, infrastructure for accelerating economic uh, activities. Uh, the airport uh, agreement uh, was signed, the short agreement. Uh, it is the first country uh, uh, of uh, visa exemptions was signed with, and also encouraging and prote protection of investments. These agreements would build trust in the business communities, both in the Emirates and in Israel, and uh, prove that we mean business. We mean doing business with them. We see delegations that come and go. And I'd like to say one thing. First of all, the MFA is uh, has a history of advancing economic ties, even when it was under uh, guys or behind the scenes. And we advanced activities of all, over 500 companies in the Gulf countries, and we did this thanks to the knowledge we have, the expertise that we've gained, and the ties that we have. Today we can discuss it, but there were other times that we couldn't even mention it, and sometimes it's very frustrating to see others getting the credit for it, but we are highly focused in this role, together with other economic uh, uh, institutions, the Ministry of Export, on building that uh, layer of economic ties. Uh, uh, the mission in Arena that was opened in 2019 with the presence of an Israeli diplomat. That's a permanent mission. That was also a foot in the door, even though it was very focused on the uh, needs of the mission in Abu Dhabi, but that was a very important uh, move. The Americans did not only spread their political and diplomatic umbrella and pave the way, but they came with an initiative of having a triple uh, foundation uh, for the Emirates, the Americans, and Israel of $3 billion that is supposed to support the different projects led by the private sector and developing other initiatives for regional economic development. This is a very important tool. And I'm saying this again, uh, it's important to talk to talk, but we also need to walk the walk and create the tools and the infrastructure that would allow the business community to advance projects. And I also mean uh, commerce and projects of infrastructures. I believe that the vision of Israel cut of uh, the peace railroads some criticize this vision, but I believe that today it seems totally feasible and still there's work that needs to be done. And I think that our approach should change and our view should be more regional and wide. It's not only bilateral, but also to be helped and to build partnerships with other international conglomerates that can be found in the Emirates, whether it's a German or Arabian or French, and not to compete against them, but to create partnership. That would open new opportunities for Israel vis-a-vis -vis other European and Asian uh, uh, companies. One last point that I would like to talk about is Expo 2021. Uh, the MFA uh, led the building uh, the Israeli booth of the Expo exhibition that would take place in the Gulf uh, for the first time. It was uh, postponed to 2021. This is not only going to be a very impressive booth with, with very uh, impressive uh, presentations. 25 million people are supposed to visit.
visit this booth, but to also create uh, thematic uh, delegations on topics that are of interest to the region, be it issues of smart transportation, uh, high precision agriculture, desertification, water desalination, irrigation, uh, think uh, 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 telemedicine, uh, medical uh, research and studies, cyber protection, renewable energies, all those things that characterize other issues that are of concern to society, women, minorities, uh, the elderly, etc. It's important to mention this because a new world of possibilities opens up. The MFA is a leading fact, uh, actor in making these possibilities available to the Israeli economy and private sector and to create that connections that couldn't have been imagined beforehand, but they do turn into a reality today. This is our mission. Thank you. Thank you, Yael. We are about to finish the session and I'd like to take at least five minutes to give a brief question to each speaker and to you, Udi and Ksenia. Each one of you in your own ways involved in uh, civil uh, diplomacy, whether it's through academic uh, collaborations or your journalistic work in your uh, career, and you even wrote a book about it recently, if you could very, very briefly mention an insight regarding the importance of of these civilian ties and work with Arab countries in a non-official manner, whether it's acad as academics or journalists. Well, let me just say that Israel must encourage in every possible way the collaboration and cooperation between citizens in order to build bridges of cooperation and peace, not just between organizations and not just between military personnel, because this is what characterizes our relationship with both Egypt and Jordan, but we must advance broader, much more extensive ties that go beyond that go beyond uh, what has been so far in the Arab world. The Arab countries, of course, uh, countries uh, that are, you know, with uh, that are kingdoms with kings, and maybe there's a person or one group of people who are the decision makers, but we cannot ignore the weight of the elites and their interest, their interest in the economy, their interest in a dialogue and research. And I learned from my ties, the ties I had developed over the years, that people on the other side are very curious about us. They want to know they actually want to know so much about us. There's this entire trend in all Middle Eastern countries, not just in Saudi Arabia with the Saudi bloggers and others. We can see more and more people who are studying Hebrew, who are learning about Israel, even in Egypt and in other places, even sometimes if it, uh, you know, costs them their freedom, their liberty or their career, but they're still very much interested in us. So, you know, we don't want to find ourselves in 25 years time as we uh, convene, hopefully not on Zoom, hopefully things are better by then. And as we look back at the ties developed with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and Bahrain, maybe with other countries in the region, and we'll say we missed our opportunity because, because we left it only to official elements and mainly uh, people from the security establishment and these quite naturally already know each other. I mean, there is already trade in arms and commerce and that exists, but we mustn't, you know, neglect that if we want to instill content, genuine substance into these agreements. And once again, I go back uh, to this statement that, uh, you know, as a citizen or even as a Knesset member representing Israel uh, at the time, I was pretty shocked by that state by that statement uh, that people said, you know, we think uh, that civil relations are not that important. The only important thing is that we have cooperation with the Egyptian, between the Egyptian army and the Israeli army in the Gaza border, for example. But one doesn't rule out the other. It's important to foster ties with these countries that we used to have, used to have wars with. Uh, these uh, hostiles, these relations used to be very hostile. Sometimes it's uh, even very hostile. This hostility hasn't necessarily been a 
hasn't disappeared necessarily, and we have to grapple with that, not just with the tweets of Ayatollah Khamenei. And I think that right now this development has to be much more natural and much more rapid, and we see a clear cut, a very obvious interest of uh, Emirati research institutes and others. Uh, they show a great interest in us, and we better not miss that train. We have to see how we build this, and this is where the diplomats go in, as well as scholars and academics who have researched these countries who know what the code of conduct is, how to dress for meetings, how to speak with people, what can be even expected from this collaboration. Thank you very much. Ksenia Udi, would you like to add anything? Yes, I'd like to say uh, to say something very brief. I concur with what Ksenia uh, said, and of course, from my perspective as an academic, I believe that dialogue with my counterparts in the Arab world is very important. There is a certain opportunity here with the Gulf countries, at least in recent years, some of the leaders talked about the fact that education and opening up uh, academic institutions are very important to them. They invited American institutions. Uh, some of them are no longer there. There is a lot of collaboration with American universities and Gulf countries for example, Georgetown and NYU. And if we are talking uh, honestly about an encounter between societies, between a society that's open with an academic, open academic uh, complex, uh, the question is, uh, you know, with our counterparts, how open are the societies there? Can you truly strive for a sincere research in an academic world that's a bit similar to the, uh, acad to the diplomatic world that we talked about Israel, which was under British and American dominance since World War II, and now we see a certain change there as well, and that will compel us in academia to think beyond the U.S. and Britain, and I'm certain that there will be opportunities there as well. Thank you very much indeed. In our activities in Mitvim Institute, we can see how ties are being fostered with institutions in the UAE, including memorandums for collaboration, and there are other ties less official with other elements in the region, Chaim and Yael. Now I move on to you briefly with respect to Jordan. Jordan and the Palestinians in our surveys, we see that the people in Israel attribute a less and less importance uh, to the uh, uh, peace accords with Jordan. It's been the anniversary of these peace accords this past week, and it went out and it was complete, almost completely unmentioned. So what do you think about that? What is the role of the foreign ministry? And this is where we can see the most obvious affiliation between the ties with the Arab countries and the Palestinian issue. If you could just address this very briefly, because we have the Knesset members who are waiting for their turn to speak. Nimrod, I will answer very briefly that I think a region opportunity has been created here that could be beneficial to all regional countries. Both Jordan and Palestine can be involved in many projects that will contribute uh, to a uh, well-being, economic uh, success. I wouldn't underestimate any peace accords with any country. These are very important. They give us great security and hopefully these new winds of uh, peace and of economic ties will trickle down and expand and impact uh, the well-being and economy of all nations living in this country, in this region. Thank you, Chaim. Would you like to add anything? Let me repeat what I said. I truly hope I definitely concur with what Ksenia said, both about the Gulf countries and Jordan. They weren't really disappointed because for them, Israel has a great power, and the reason was they weren't really exposed to Israel. We have this image as if we're omnipotent, and now that everybody's, you know, going for the Gulf area, hopefully we'll meet the expectations, because their expectations at least uh, are above and beyond, especially in the Emirates, as whether it's business and culture, Israeli culture and Israeli tourists, and hopefully we won't disappoint them, we won't let them down. And as for Jordan, I think that Jordan, I led the negotiations on the Aram Naharaim area. It was a very painful point that the Jordanians, they and the Palestinians are connected to each other. And I think that they've started to internalize over the past few weeks, they've uh, began to realize that something significant has happened here. And the more they lag behind, if they continue to lag behind, they'll continue to lose out. And perhaps this is what will truly change and will uh, lead the Jordanians. I don't know about the Palestinians, but definitely the Jordanians, because ultimately 
athlete Jordan is under is a, under great difficulties and uh, when they look to the left and to the right their most significant support or their ability to develop significant things in trade in a business is Israel not Syria not Iraq or other countries in the region and I think that the fact that the issue of annexation is off the table and the fact that countries, I mean, the UAE is a very important ally of Jordan, Bahrain to a certain extent. So you see, perhaps uh, this uh, certain line will be drawn and they'll say, okay, we get it, we need to recalculate and perhaps the Palestinians also will revisit the entire situation but everybody's saying right now, first of all, let's wait for November 3rd for the election results. And this is excuse everybody's using. And maybe it could be, I mean, just like everybody else, we're just waiting for next week to see how things evolve. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Mitvim Institute for this conference. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the speakers in this session. You gave us a comprehensive picture from within the government system and from outside.